we have a special guest today, Brian from Mountain Bullion Entertainment. He's been a guest on several videos, but he's going to join us today during the live stream. And you are going to hear everything that you need to know about silver and gold. Hey, Brian, welcome to Ron's Basement. Welcome to the live stream. Good morning. I, I appreciate being back in the basement, and it's an honor to be here once again. Well, my friend, what do you think is going on right now, Brian, with the silver to gold ratio? And let me ask you a question. Everybody calls it the gold to silver ratio, but to me, it seems more like the silver to gold ratio when it takes 80 to 90 ounces of silver to get one ounce of gold. I, I agree. It's almost like the, the term is inverted, like they should have they should do it the other way. <laughs> We're going to have to start a campaign to have everybody call it the silver to gold ratio, right? That's right, because that's really what it is, is the silver to gold ratio. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've already got that established so far. But let's talk about what's interesting going on with the silver to gold ratio. What do you see uh, that you think silver and gold investors should be paying attention to when you look at this ratio? Well, you know what I think is interesting is today it's about 87 to 1. And if you look back as recently as 2021 during the silver squeeze, that ratio had gotten down to 64 to 1. And so this is, is very touchable. This is something that I think we could see again soon in the near future. Um, the way the metals have reacted um, to just talks about uh, rate cuts this year, you know, they're projecting three of them and the metals already started moving. Once they actually start doing those rate cuts, um, I could see us getting, you know, hopefully back to like a 64 to one ratio. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm doing some math here uh, on my calculator behind the scenes. If, if it, let's just say $2,100 gold, which uh, we're going to check the gold price here in a second, but $2,100 gold, if there were a 64 to one silver to gold ratio, that would be pretty close to $33 per ounce silver. How would that make you feel, Brian? I would feel great about that. It would definitely be a step in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I don't think any of us uh, would complain about $33 silver right now, although we know that it could go much higher. You know, something else I've heard about the silver to gold ratio uh, that I find very interesting is this idea when it's, it's kind of compared to a rubber band, right? Um, you talked mm -hmm. about how it was 64. We know if we look back in history, it's been as low as like eight to one, 20 to one at other times in history. We know, Brian, that the mining companies only mine about seven or eight ounces of silver for each one ounce of gold they bring out of the ground. Yeah. So when, so when we think about this, this ratio, 85, whatever you said it was, 90, it's been as high as lately. It's uh -huh. like a rubber band. It gets stretched. And, you know, what happens eventually with a rubber band or a bungee cord once you stretch it too far? Either it breaks, which we know won't be the case, or it comes it comes flying back. There's a lot of energy stored in that. Absolutely. It'll come snapping back with a lot of force. And if you guys could imagine if it was one to seven, and the gold price was, you know, let's say like two thousand two hundred dollars. I mean, we'd be looking at a silver price of like three hundred and fourteen bucks. Oh, don't say it, Brian. Are you a silver pumper? I, 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 told I, you. I, I try not to be. I, I'm just <laughs> optimistic. I, you know, I get called a silver pumper so often. I, when I get a chance to call somebody else a silver pumper, I'm going to jump all over it. And you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I'm really a silver pumper. I'm just telling people what I think, what I see, right? I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I'm like a lot of other people who I consider to be intelligent. And when I look at the like the the technical factors, which I would say the silver to gold ratio is kind of a technical ratio, but when I look at the fundamental factors for silver, yeah, I could see 100, 200, 300 dollars silver. I don't think it's out of the question. I mean, I don't think it is either, especially when you look at um, how many people might decide to jump into it um, once they do start doing the rate cuts. Um, yeah. You know, we could be looking at, at a real scarcity situation where people aren't able to to find the silver they wanted at their local coin shop. Um, and, you know, I could see that price getting up there pretty high. Well, you, you bring up a great point, Brian, because I say it all the time. Things are different now in the silver market. We know that, like uh, from a from from the perspective of what's on the COMEX, what's on the LBMA, 
where the prices are manipulated, but just the inventory situation that's going on, kind of those fundamental factors. But hey, if we just look back one year ago right now, Brian, you couldn't get silver at your local coin shop because we had that little banking crisis. The news spread quickly and silver now in the modern age, right, because of people being able to buy things online, it just it can it, it can disappear uh, quickly. You don't have to go to the local coin shop, although a lot of people do. And that's great. But a lot of people now, they, the, the whole supply of retail investable silver can be wiped out in the matter of a day or two days or three days with online sales. Absolutely. It could go incredibly fast, um, you know, especially um, if people get that panic, you know, they realize yeah. the silver price is moving. Uh, they get the fear of missing out. They get the FOMO. They hop online with their credit card. And, you know, these transactions will process really quick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and silver is the ultimate FOMO vehicle. I heard somebody say that about gold, like gold was the original FOMO, right? That people would fear of missing out when it would run. Right. But I think silver is the ultimate. I mean, we know when I talk to Mike over at Pimbex, when I talk to Coin Shop Chris, when I talk to all my contacts, I, I, you hear Rick Rule say it. People buy more silver. I don't know why they do it. It doesn't make any sense, but people buy more silver when the price is going up. They don't buy it when it's going down. They sell when it's, I mean, it's opposite of what they should do. So people like us who are very consistent, maybe say dollar cost average type silver investors, we position ourselves, right? I like to buy when it's down. I know it's hard to do, but the, the herd Right. That those people that aren't on this live stream this morning. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, the herd likes to buy silver when the price is going up. They'd rather buy it at thirty dollars an ounce with high premiums than buy it at twenty four dollars an ounce with low premiums. Does it make any sense, Brian? It, it really doesn't make any sense. It, it's quite odd. Uh, something about the human condition when something's cheap. You know, there's this assumption that uh, it's it's not going to do anything. This this will never perform. And, you know, you, it's the same thing will happen with uh, Bitcoin when it's cheap. Nobody's buying it. And then when it's going up, a bunch of people are buying it, you know, when it's towards mm -hmm. the top. Yeah, because most people and that same thing with the S&P 500 and the magnificent seven stocks, people don't really even, I think, understand the fundamentals behind what they're buying. Uh, they just buy it because everybody else buys it. I can't tell you how many people I know that say, I have Apple stock. I made a lot of money on Apple stock. And they don't really know. They know what Apple phones are. They know what Apple uh, computers are. But they don't really know what they're getting. And I would put out the argument that people like us that are that are putting in the work to understand the real true fundamental reasons why silver and gold, for that matter, and even the precious metal mining stocks right now, uh, are such an attractive value proposition that in the end, I believe that we will be justly rewarded. <laughs> I agree. I mean, uh, this stuff is on sale right now. It's it's one of those things where if you can get it now, uh, you know, if you're looking back a year and a half, two years from now, you'll probably be very happy that you did because these yeah. things uh, take a while to play out, you know, especially with uh, silver and gold when they go on their bull runs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about this? Let's talk about something else we can be happy about, Brian. How about the prospect? And I don't think most silver and gold investors can really grasp this or want to recognize that it's possible. But how about the idea that we could, I heard somebody the other day say we could go on a 10 year bull run in the precious metals, you know, kind of similar to what happened in the seventies, right? I mean, it, it's happened before we could go on like a five, 10, 15 year bull run in gold and silver because is it possible absolutely you know you right now we're looking at a situation where um the the um inflation is still rising at much higher than the two percent rate that they want to be at they're basically going to be forced to start cutting rates soon and with inflation still clipping along as high as it is i could definitely see something like a 10-year bull run for the metals Yep. Yep. So gold's at $2,200 almost, right? Let's go, let's run out real quick. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say thanks to our channel sponsor, Pimbex. <clears throat> and hold on here. Let's go check on the, let's go check on the gold price. Let me refresh this. So we've got gold up about $10, 2,175 silver uh, knocking on the door, <clears throat> excuse me, for $25 per ounce. 
Uh, while we're out here, I just I want to say thank you very importantly to channel sponsor Pimbex. Uh, as you can see, they are an online bullion dealer, gold, silver, and platinum group metals. If you check out Pimbex and you compare their prices, you compare their service and their selection to all the other online bullion dealers, I think you'll find what I found. Uh, they check all the boxes and you will get more metal for your money. Brian, what do you think <clears throat> here as we look at this gold 2175? How do you think? Do you think silver has some catching up to do at this point? It's got a lot of catching up to do. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point in this bull market cycle, we do see it go lower than it did in 2021. We, we might see it go, you know, lower than that 64 to 1 uh, gold to silver ratio we had seen just a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, we know there's been price manipulation. Are you one of the believers that the silver price has been manipulated over the last number of years, even decades? What are your what are your thoughts on that on that subject, Brian? I, I do believe that they have been manipulated. Um, you know, we have had a couple of court cases where they found that um, people were guilty of spoofing. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, when we're looking at the stuff that's go going on with the Silver Institute right now, you know, this is a place where we all go to um, kind of try and project what might happen in the future for the metals. And a lot of these numbers that they put out end up getting revised. Um, they had um, estimated that there was going to be about 140 million ounces of silver going into solar. And then it turned out that it was uh, much higher in 2023. It was more like 180 million ounces, 190 million ounces of silver um, that had gone into solar panels. And so, of course, they're kind of revising that up. Um, they had projected the industrial demand to be up 4%, but it ended up being up 8%. So double what they had projected. And they had also uh, projected a supply deficit of about 142 million ounces. And then they ended up having to revise that to 194 million ounces. So uh, all the numbers that they're putting out skew, you know, potential investors to, to, to move away. It doesn't look as attractive as it should. And so I'm starting to get a little suspicious about them. Yeah. And I know there's been uh, uh, some articles published lately. Um, our mutual friend, John Little uh, at the Silver Academy puts out a daily, really interesting article about silver, gold, sometimes several a day. Uh, I've got a link to his work in the description of this video, but there's been some, some uh, a little bit of rumbling lately that maybe the Silver Institute numbers need to be examined a little more closely. I know um, I spoke to this um, demand profile that we're seeing for solar uh, three or four days back. And I got a couple of emails from people saying those numbers are so wrong. One guy even said that, that, that he believed that the demand for solar last year was as high as 300 million ounces. And this is major for silver. Uh, Phillips Baker, the CEO of Hecla Mining, right? A hundred year old silver mine, the biggest silver miner. He, he was talking about this the other day that like this demand for solar is massive. It was really almost nothing 10 years ago. And now we're looking at what, 180 million on the official numbers. And people are projecting conservatively that within two years, the solar industry could be sucking in 250 million ounces a year. Brian, the whole mining industry which is which is which is uh, generating lower and lower amounts of silver every year. The whole mining industry only digs up about 800 million ounces a year. And this this process that we've gone through over the last three years, I'm almost done with my rant here, by the way. But this process we've gone through the last three years, where there's been a deficit, where they've been able to plug that deficit with above ground supplies. Guess what? Those above ground supplies are not infinite. Silver is finite. That's one of the things we love about silver. I mean, the fundamentals are crazy. Uh, any thoughts on, on what I just uh, rambled on about, Mr. Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really crazy because you figure, uh, you know, if it gets up in that um, over 200 million ounce range, so, so you're looking at basically 25% of the total mine supply every year. And of course, um, yeah, this year, the, the projection coming out of the Silver Institute, you know, which we should probably take uh, with a grain of salt, 
is that um, the demand is going to be about 1.2 billion ounces with a supply of about a billion ounces. Well, that that's still, you know, basically a 200 million ounce deficit, basically the same deficit we saw last year. And um, the the above ground stockpiles, um, they're going to be getting tapped into. And I do think that we're going to see a situation where the demand for physical silver will overpower um, the price oppression done by the paper markets, you know, uh, sooner or later. I, I do believe well, the, that's going to come. The, the, the above ground supplies already have been tapped into. I mean, over the last three years to the tune of a half billion ounces. They're saying like 500 million ounces uh, of, of above ground silver have been depleted over the last three years because of this uh, supply deficit that we have right now. I mean, it is just crazy. And then you look at India, okay? You look at yeah. India in February, imports 70 million ounces of silver. India has these incredible solar farms they're building. Some of them like bigger than the size of Manhattan. I'm telling you, Brian, I'm getting worried that I'm going to wake up one morning and the sun's not going to shine because the, India is sucking in all the world's sunshine. <laughs> right, yeah, they're absorbing all that energy. <laughs> maybe yeah, it'll that, maybe it'll help global warming i don't know you know <laughs> yeah maybe so that that is a uh a massive solar farm um uh, that they have over there i think that uh you had said it was close to the the pakistan border yeah and it's just unreal and you know they're bringing in a lot of silver for uh jewelry and silverware as well yeah um i mean th those two industries i think they're projecting um that jewelry is going to have an increase in demand of six percent this year and um and silver is going to have an increase of nine percent i might have those switched but uh but yeah india is definitely um absorbing a lot of silver right now yeah it's it's i mean it's just absolutely crazy and i i personally i like silver jewelry better than gold jewelry i love gold no i'm not putting gold down right it's the king of the precious metals but I love silver. You know, I'm looking up at your picture there. Those are some, uh, I see some Philharmonics. Is that correct? Uh, yes, these are some Philharmonics. What do you think about Philharmonics? Let's go out. Hey, what does everybody say? Let's go. I didn't really properly introduce you, Brian. This is Brian from Mountain Bullion Entertainment. He's been a good friend of the channel for a long time. Here's his channel, Mountain Bullion Entertainment. He puts out videos once or twice a week, looks like to me. Um, yeah, usually, usually about once a week. Sometimes I'll, I'll squeeze out a second one, but you, normally it's about once a week. <laughs> when you said you squeeze, squeezed out a second one, I can't, that, that brought up a bad image, but I squeezed out a second video. <laughs> it might um, not have been the best term to use. Yeah, well, you know, we'll forgive you. This is the basement after all. Um, I thought I saw a video on here about uh, Austrian Philharmonics. Are they good to stack? There they, There it is right there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because I have some, so I'm curious your thoughts on Philharmonics. Are they good to stack? You know, I think that they're a really good coin to stack. Uh, it does mm -hmm. have, you know, that confidence that it's a coin. A lot of times uh, for, you know, the bullion grade mm -hmm. coins, it's going to be the lowest price ones that you can get. Sometimes there will be exceptions to that. Um, they're easily recognized Hold worldwide. Uh, every <laughs> coin shop... Uh, out there is going to um, to know exactly what they are, and you know the the yeah. gold philharmonics too. They're extremely popular um, internationally. In 2022, they were the top selling gold bullion coins in Europe and yeah. Japan. Wow, wow! The philharmonics, yes, the gold philharmonics. Okay. The gold philharmonics. Sorry, I was having some uh, technical difficulties there. Bear with me. I'm going to put you. Hey, back no sweat. Up. I'm putting you back up. There you go. All right. Keep talking to me about Philharmonics. I'm going to go back to your channel. I apologize. Hey, hey, no sweat at all. Um, but, the, you know, they're three nines fine, just like the uh, the Silver Eagles. And I, yeah. I do think that they're great. Um, it does, it's a beautiful coin. Um, now, it does have a pipe organ on it that looks a lot like a building. And so, you know, when I first saw them, I had always assumed that that was a building, but it's a big old pipe organ. Um, this ah. was the first coin to be, um, priced in euros, you know, with a, a 1.5 euro face value on a silver coin. Interesting. Interesting. And it also has all the string instruments. I, I have a little, um, 
a, a little a, a great big little job that I do right by my house in the evenings at a at a uh, kind of a high end private music school, and I've gotten to know some of the the best violin, viola, and cello teachers around, uh, really around the world. These people travel everywhere, and um, and they love when I show them the Philharmonic because it has it has all the string instruments. And uh, yeah, I thought that was a building as well. So we learned something from you today. Uh, let's see what else you got on your channel here. You interviewed um, the Silver Hermit lately. He's a, a, also a friend of the channel. There it is there. Uh, do I have that up on the screen? No, I don't. Hold on here. Yeah, no uh, sweat. He, yeah, uh, so, he, the Silver Hermit, yeah. he is so creative and so smart. Um, he mm -hmm. just has so much to offer. I really think of him as like kind of a diamond in the rough in the silver uh, community. Yeah, yeah, he's a smart guy. He said something I think all of our viewers need to listen to that I think, I don't, I don't even think he realized how powerful and in my opinion, how true this is. Um, and if I'm misquoting him, he can email me and I'll, and I'll put out a public apology. But when we were talking, <laughs> he said, he said, it's really, and, and I'm going to put it in the synopsis here. It's really going to be go time for silver and gold when we see higher inflation numbers coming through. And at the same time that we get these higher inflation numbers, that we also see gold and silver going up. Because right now there's this whole, and we even, we have got some inflation numbers coming out this Friday, uh, this whole uh, theory that oh, if inflation's high, that means the Fed's going to be tighter with monetary policy and the dollar will go up and prices of gold and silver will go down. But when it's surrender time is what I'll call it, which is when we do get these prints, and I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen real soon. These higher inflation prints as we move through 2024 and into 2025 and simultaneously the market wakes up and realizes the Fed can't raise rates, that that really is going to be go time for the silver price and gold price. And when I say gold time, that go time, I mean, that's when we're talking about $2,700 gold, $2,800 gold, $3,000 gold. And silver is just going to take off like crazy. I mean, silver, uh, from every perspective, uh, has has been, has, it really is like that beach ball being held underwater right now. Oh yeah. I, I could see it just exploding and it, he is so insightful. Um, I, you know, I would guess he totally hit the nail on the head. Um, and you know, once it starts moving, I mean, silver might really end up surprising all of us with uh, how much upside potential it has um, from all the pressure being built up for so many years of it being suppressed. Yeah. Yep. 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 So I had a question for you. Let's go back here. One of our viewers had a really great question. Let me see if I can I can pull it up here again, Brian. I'm going to get your this is this is this one's we're, guys. We're going to be and thank you everybody. 250, Brian. We have 250 people joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Ron's basement. Brian's in Brian's basement, but it's a big deal. I mean, think about that. It's like we're in a virtual meeting with each other. All 250 of us. Thank you for being here. Right, it's not Brian Tube, it's not Ron Tube, it's YouTube. So thank you. Please give this a thumbs up. We'll ask you that one time. Super chats are always super appreciated, never expected, and you can always subscribe to the channel if you want to get a new piece of content every day about our favorite subject, silver, gold, right? The precious metals, the precious metal mining stocks. Now, Brian, yep. I've got a I've got a question for you. This came from one of our viewers, <clears throat> and, and she asked me initially, Hi, Ron, could you talk about when we might be able to recognize we've reached the top of the upcoming silver bull market? How will we know when we're reaching the top? And then what? What do we do? Do we sell and buy a house, a vehicle, or maybe income-producing investments? Any thoughts on that, Brian? You know, that that's a really good question. Um, that the housing market right now, I do feel like is behaving a little odd, um, that there is a lot of investment groups, um, that are holding houses right now. Yeah. Um, we're, we're having a bit of a inventory, um, problem. So, so the housing supply is low. Um, so there's not a lot of housing for people to, to consider. Of course, the interest rates are really high and just, you know, not a lot is going on. Yeah. Um, as far as 
How do we know when it's the top in silver? Let's say, let's say we do have this great bowl run in silver. Um, our friend here, Pinola 9840. I mean, what, what I'll tell you what I think, but I'm just curious. Do you have any thoughts? Like, because I think most people don't think about that. People think, oh, I can see silver going up and up and up. But I think a lot of us do ourselves a disservice by not having a plan. Like, what am I going to do? Or at what point might I convert some of my silver into like another real investment? Any anything, anything you might be looking at during that process? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be keeping a close eye on it. And, and I am hoping to, to time it well and yeah. uh, convert some of my... Um, silver you know into land um once i once i think the time is right um it, most likely there will be a bit of a top and then you know we're gonna see some pullback um you know like you might expect during any bull market cycles um as far as it goes i would recommend watching the the gold to silver ratio and once yeah. you see that they start to get into more more of a historic average um, for the modern age, you know, that might be somewhere more between like 40 to one to, to 60 to one in regards to the gold to silver ratio. But I, I would encourage people in regards to, to real estate, to land, um, to also watch the inventory. Cause I, I feel like right now, um, the last I checked, we had about 665,000, um, houses on the market. They are projecting a lot more to be coming online. Cause a lot of the uh, baby boomer generations, uh, it's going to be selling over the next 10 years. Um, if we get up um, to where we're over a million um, active listings, maybe 1.5 million active listings, I think we're going to see a lot of downward pressure on the housing prices. And so in, in regards to housing, I would kind of wait for that. Um, yeah. Once we've seen that, both of those things kind of come in line where, where the housing prices start to get more affordable again and the gold or silver ratio comes into a true historic average, that that's probably going to be your top. And it would be hard for me to say when it is, but my, my guess would be here within the next few years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think right now, in my opinion, is not a good time to be buying a house. I think we're at the tail end of a bubble or a mini bubble. Um, uh, you know, That's I think right now too. I was, yeah, and I, and I was and I was doing some some. You know, I, I think one of the keys. Well, let me. I, here's what I think in terms of knowing when nobody is going to know for sure when the top is right. Uh, right. It's next to impossible to say this is it. You know, I unfortunately will not be able to come on the show here in the basement. Maybe it'll be three years from now. Maybe it'll be five years. Maybe it'll be three months. Who knows? Right. We don't know when when this could happen, and there's no right. guarantee that it will happen. I think we will see major up. Uh, upturn in the price of silver, but I'm not going to be able to come on here someday and, and ring the bell, uh, you know, and say, that's it guys. We hit the, with the, today's the top sell everything. Right. I wish I could, right. but I, so we got to look, you know, uh, I, I think one thing we can look at is uh, when all the ducks are quacking, right. When all the, when all the people on CNBC, when your neighbors, when you're getting flyers in the mail saying, we'll buy your silver. When you're, when, when everybody's talking about, when people are talking about silver at your uncle Louie's house on Thanksgiving, right? That might be the time to, to, that that will be a sign at least that we're getting close. Um, I think if premiums get really high again, that's usually a sign, right? People, we don't talk about that. Like premiums Absolutely. on silver, premiums right now are pretty darn low. Right. So yep. now's a good time to be. But that and that shows lower retail demand. If the premiums explode. Right. And we see like we saw a year ago where there's 100 percent premiums on uh, on certain types of junk silver or on American silver eagles. That's one of the signs to consider. Um, uh, you know, it, I, when, there's no, when, when there's no silver at your local coin shop or you got to wait six weeks. If you buy it online from one of the online bullion dealers, that's a good sign, okay? And I agree with you 100%, the silver to gold ratio. And again, it's about converting, okay? It's If, if we do have this massive value recognition uh, within the silver price, whoop, whoop, I just knocked Susie over. Sorry, Susie. <laughs> um, it's, about, it's about converting. It's not about selling. You aren't going to want to you do whatever you want, but I'd be careful. Number, I'd, 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 I'd warn two things. Number one, don't do it all at once. If you do it all at once, you're taking a risk, right? I would say at most, if you think it's time to sell in the top, sell half, right? And hope you're wrong. Hope the half you keep continues to go up in value. That's really uh, the good other advice. Thing is, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that advice. And the other, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> and, and the other, the other thing is, um, uh, keep an eye on and convert. Don't convert it into cash. Don't convert it into unicorn fart dust paper. Anything. Right. You're converting it into something real. Right. Like, and it's all yeah. about it's it's all about relative value. You talked about houses earlier. Right now, it would probably cost, let's say, 10,000 ounces of silver to buy a house. If six years from now, you can buy that same house for a thousand ounces of silver. And we even hear, I've heard Rafi Farber, and he's not predicting, I don't think that this absolutely will happen, but that we could see a scenario where you could buy a house for a hundred ounces of silver, a small rental house, whatever. But it's about that relative, like right now, I don't think a $250,000 house is worth 10,000 ounces of silver. Um, I that same house might be worth a thousand ounces of silver. Go ahead, my friend. I'm sorry. I rambled. Thank you for that super chat. Wow. Wow. I think that's James. Thank you. Go ahead, my friend. Thank you, James. Hey, um, and no sweat. I, you know, and I, I do think um, what you said about not converting it to cash is really important because uh, of course, you know, you'd just be exposing those profits to continued inflation. And the nice thing about having a stack is, is you can just bleed off a little bit of it at a time. You're not selling off a major asset, you know, that, you know, maybe you have paid off like your car, your house and exposing all of those profits to that potential continued inflation. Um, you know, you can, like you said, half your stack, you know, whatever works for you, uh, 10% of your stack, 80% of your stack, you know, just depending on what your goals are. Um, but I do think that there will be a time in this cycle that will be ideal for converting to real estate if people are looking to do that. And if it, it ends up being that we're in a true hyperinflation situation, um, which eventually will happen to any fiat currency, um, you know, you will see a scenario where the cost of housing will be very affordable when comparing it to uh, your silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting scenario uh, to think about. I think what's critical for people, I'll repeat this. Susie likes to call me Ron the Repeater, um, but like it's it's easy. I don't know. I don't know if you do this, Brian, but it's like easy for me to sit around and dream about oh silver, and I don't really have like a specific number in my head. But someday, uh, to me, it's a generational investment, right? And I feel good about it. And the downside risk is far outweighed by the upside potential. But I don't, it's it's easy just to sit around and have this warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's it's hard to think about a real plan, right? Like what will I do if I if, if I can convert a thousand ounces for a a nice house that maybe I can use for rental purpose. Like you gotta have a, a some type of concrete plan in place because it could become actually, <laughs> I mean, counterintuitively, I think very stressful for people. Uh, they don't realize this, but if silver does, then you're then you're like, well, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and the worst thing we want to do is make an emotion based decision. That's a good point. You know, um, you got to keep your head on straight. You don't want to panic in these situations and make sure that you're getting the most uh, bang for your buck, so to speak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, um, uh, I tell you what, what might be a good idea. Can I show the picture of my writing more? There it is. There it is. Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I specifically bought everyone a gold colored riding mower so that I could put a $2,500 gold sticker on it. But I'll tell you one thing you might want to consider uh, converting your, um, your your silver for if we get a big up is some oil producing land because uh, you ever have that situation, Brian, where there's like something you know you need to do around your house, but you keep putting it off and then it becomes like a little mountain of guilt. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Uh, yes. Unfortunately, I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> so last year, I never changed the oil in the Cub Cadet. And I'm one of those real <laughs> fastidious oh, no. people. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, used it all year. And, you know, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do it next year. So yesterday, I finally bit the bullet. I went and bought some oil. Whoa. I bought a five-gallon jug of oil. It was like almost $30. I thought, what is going on, Right. Um, and then of course, you know, I bit the bullet and I'll tell you this, man, when you work on a, any, anytime I touch a lawnmower or a car, uh -huh. somehow my, I get, I get covered in, uh, in, in oil. And then I had to go buy a new battery for the darn thing. And am I the only guy that goes through this? Like, oh dang. Know, yeah, I had to buy a new battery. The battery was five years old. I was tired. We were last year, 
Uh, I'm very frugal. And last year I thought, well, you know, I'll get one more year out of this battery. So I had to like jumpstart the, the, the tractor with the car. And I, I'm, I'm so cheap that I wouldn't <laughs> go get a new battery. And I tried charging it up this year. I went, then I'm driving to get a battery and there's an auto zone right by my house. I'm like, well, I don't want to go there because I'll pay too much. And should I drive to the farm store? <clears throat> and I'm looking online at Walmart and everything else. Finally, I just went to AutoZone, and uh, thank God they had a battery for forty dollars, which uh, which worked, you know. But uh, but yeah, you know those things, and got the oil changed, got myself covered in oil. But oil, I was just like just regular ten W thirty motor oil. I was shocked by the price, just absolutely shocked. That that does seem like it's gone up a lot, and I do end up in those situations. I had to do a new um, positive uh, battery terminal. Uh, for my vehicle recently. And, um, you know, of course I went over and, and got the cheapest one I could find at the, uh, the park store. And I knew it wasn't ideal. It didn't look exactly like my old one. And then I ended up spending hours finagling this thing to get it, uh, to get it on right and, and working, you know, uh, when yeah. I probably should have just spent the other uh, 10 bucks for the ones that would have been easier <laughs> to, to work yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I, I spent 20 minutes shopping online for a new battery and then about another five minutes trying to decide if I should, it, it, the far, I love going to the farm store. Okay. I love the farm store. We have, but there's not, I live in more of a middle, upper middle class Chesterfield. I live, we live in the more modest part of Chesterfield, St. Louis, but it's a kind of a middle, upper middle class suburb. And so we don't have a farm store that's within 15 miles. And I love the like farm and home and those farm stores uh, because you get, you get good deals, right? I mean, you know, I oh mean, yeah, you, you can I, out here. It's tractor supply. At least that's the yeah. one that, that's near me. Yeah. But, and, but you know, I spent like a half hour looking online and I'm like, should I drive to the farm stores at work driving all, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, you just got to bite the bullet, right. And, and save yourself some time. <laughs> yeah. Cause, Cause sometimes I'll end up thinking to myself also, I get you on know, pretty frugal, like, well, how much am I going to spend on gas if I drive yeah. half an hour? Or if I just go to the nearest store, I'll spend basically nothing on gas, but I'll spend another four bucks. You know, I, I end up weighing all these things. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, put, I have a $2,500 gold sticker on the gold. And then Susie is going to be cutting the grass this year. So let me show you what else I have for her. We have a, uh, we have an actual helmet made for her. With all right. Awesome. Yeah. Look at that. And, uh, and her very own name. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll get to snap a picture of her out there on the gold tractor and people stop and say, what does $2,500 gold mean? And she can, she can spread the good word about, uh, about gold. I'm going to go back to your channel here for a second, Brian, we're going to, we're going to put you on the spot. How do you like that? Let's go back to your I, channel. There was one on here. I wanted to ask you about, uh, what's the Yemen, uh, 550,000 ounces. Just curious what that was all about. Was that had to do with silver? I take it. That's correct. Um, they were responding to the the Houthis in Yemen, who had been um, targeting the shipping uh, vessels that were going through that area. And yeah. um, when we decided to respond, they ended up dropping a hundred Tomahawk missiles. Um, and you know, wow. there, there, yeah, that there had been a lot of. Um, of talk about that there was about 500 ounces uh, per Tomahawk missile. And luckily I was able to uh, get in touch with uh, illuminated ape. Uh, he's a great researcher. He works with uh, John little a lot and yeah. he was able to verify for me that that is uh, roughly correct. That's about how much is in each Tomahawk missile. So when they did, and I, I want to say that was just like a 24, maybe 48 hour uh, campaign of them um, hitting the Houthis with the tomahawks they dropped a hundred of them and that equals fifty thousand ounces of silver that they destroyed during that one brief uh little military campaign wow wow yeah i know andy sheckman uh talks about uh one of his contacts who he's talked with that has confirmed for him under and it's not classified information uh that there are that there are 500 ounces a monster box of silver in the tip of each Tomahawk missile. Uh, really crazy. Yeah, he's talked about it a lot. And I do believe he's the one that brought that to basically like the whole silver community's attention to begin with. Um, yeah. So yeah, I really appreciate that. And it, it's really powerful to realize that there's that much silver in one Tomahawk missile. It, it's really kind of crazy. 
Yeah, it is crazy. Hey, let's go out. Um, you know, we talk about you, you touched on this earlier. I mean, right now, uh, and I'm going to talk about this in tomorrow's live stream more to this matter, but, um, uh, the, the, the upper one half of 1% of people in the world have accumulated a majority of the wealth over the last like 10, 15 years. The wealth, wealth distribution in the United States is, is, at, is at a level <clears throat> of unfairness, a lot of people would say, like we haven't seen uh, really in the history of the country or the history of the world. Like 0.5% of the people own just an incredible amount of the assets. But when we talk about gold and silver, I was kind of giggling. I thought, well, that's like us. We're like 0.5%. We're like one in 200 people, right? The people that are on this live stream joining us right now, we are just like a sliver of the sliver. But we're starting to see more articles like this from Reuters uh, this was from this morning, gold, like articles about gold. And then by default, you know, I always I want to throw in gold. If we're talking about gold, we're talking about silver, in my opinion as well. But Reuters says here, gold firms as traders position for U.S. data. Um, uh, and it says here, gold prices firm Mondays as investors position for key economic data. We have some key economic data this week, Brian, which All right. we know will be accurate and we can believe. And. <laughs> Comments from the Federal Reserve. We're going to roast the Federal Reserve as usual this week for further confirmation on interest rate cuts signaled by the U.S. Central Bank. You may not agree with me, Brian. The viewers may not agree with me. I'm going to tell you I am out on the furthest limb of the furthest tree, right? That's the other mountain of guilt I have, a bunch of trees that need to be trimmed. But nonetheless, and I'm going to say I don't think the Fed is going to lower rates. And I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but that we can still see unbelievable returns for silver and gold. But this article comes on to tell us this is what our, our key economic data for the week is, Guy. Weekly initial jobless claims on Thursday in the U.S. core personal consumption, the PCE index, on Friday. Um, and this there we got some we got some uh, some some insight from an analyst. He says. Uh, the U.S. inflation readings will have a significant impact, and any lower than expected PCE number will lead to a weaker dollar and higher gold prices and vice versa, meaning higher silver prices as well. But that if inflation comes in higher than expected, that could be bad for silver and gold, right? Okay, whatever. Uh, the long-term outlook for gold remains bright due to expectations of rate cuts this year. Strong central bank demand and continued geopolitical crisis in Russia and the Middle East. And I don't think things are calming down in either of those areas. Uh, and this is like Reuters. It. Yeah, Reuters saying gold prices hit record peaks last week after Fed Chair Jerome Powell said the U.S. Central Bank is likely to reduce rates by three quarters of a percentage point. I'm almost done here and I'll, I'll be quiet. A slew. OK, this is what I a slew of Fed officials are expected to speak this week. I didn't pull up the calendar, but usually the week after the big Fed meeting, which was uh, announcement, which was Wednesday of last week, then the following week, which in this case is this week, we'll have a different Fed speaker out every day of the week. And then that moves the market and it's a bunch of, I mean, why has the Fed become more of a public relations firm than a bank, Brian? That's my question for you. Yeah, it does seem like they have a, a huge interest in controlling the narrative um, yeah. and kind of controlling, you know, the hearts and minds of the investors and, and keeping people, uh, comfortable with the idea that the dollar is safe, um, you know, and that, um, the bonds are still good, you know, folks to keep buying our bonds. Um, that 75% cut, uh, I, I 75% chance that, you know, that's a pretty high chance. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I agree with you. I think when um, when we're talking about gold, we're talking about silver. Of, of course, um, you know, looking back, there there's typically a lag effect, so gold will lead and then silver will follow later. And so I don't think we've really seen um, silver's bull market start yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think once they do those rate cuts, we definitely will. And, and who knows, maybe even before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to lay into the Fed, and I'm going to tell you some good news, and then I want your feedback on that as well. 
But I also want to say thank you to channel sponsor First Mining Gold. You can learn more about them at First Mining Gold. What you'll learn is they have not one, but two multi-million ounce development stage projects in Canada, the Du Parquet project in uh, Quebec and the Spring Pole project in Ontario. And they have a large interest in four other Canadian gold development stage projects. Again, you can learn more about them at firstmininggold.com or reach out to Paul Morris, their director of investor relations. I have a link to his email address in the description of this video. And our friends at Fortuna Silver, you can learn more about them at fortunasilver.com. Hey, we're wrapping up the first quarter of 2024. And if uh, that proves to be anything like the fourth quarter of 2023, Fortuna is going to be producing an unbelievable amount of cash flow. I am really excited. It's going to be a, you know six, seven weeks out, but uh, their mines in West Africa, their mines in Latin America are performing very well, uh, and they provide they they produce. I'm sorry, uh, significantly more gold now than silver. And in case you haven't noticed, the gold price has been doing very well. Brian, are you still there? Yes, I am. Yeah, sorry. I, was being I don't think the that. Fed's going to... That's okay. No, no, I'm joking around. I don't think the Fed's going to cut rates. I don't. I don't think the Fed's going to cut rates. And I think that silver and gold can still do very, very well. And I'll tell you why. Can I Can I lay out my story? And then Absolutely. I'll let you... I'll let you the Fed... I, I don't think the Fed uh, is going to want to lower rates because the inflationary pressures are still so strong. Okay, so they're going to be... They're playing a game right now, cat and mouse, right? Narrative, like you said. But they know that if they if they try to cut rates, right, that that, that could be catastrophic in terms of the inflation situation. But the Fed also can't raise rates because just the sheer amount of debt that we have in this country, the sheer amount of debt in the world, the world banking system, the world economy, the world consumers can't deal with higher rates. I think they're stuck where they are. And Jerome Powell said it himself during a 60 Minutes interview, I don't know, a few weeks back. He said, we're in a very difficult position. So here's what I think. I think I think rates are going to remain stable, but inflation is going to be coming up and up and up and eventually is going to overtake the rates again. And the Fed's not, they can't raise rates to fight that because it will, you know, implode an already precarious situation in the banking system, in the, the world monetary and financial system. And once that happens, once inflation, and I think that's what Silver Hermit, uh, maybe, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but I think that's what he was talking about. When that happens, and I think that can happen over the next 18 months, that that inflation level, once again, gets up above the interest rate level, that's when everyone realizes that the, the gig is up, right? Then that's negative real interest rates when inflation overtakes the, 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 the core interest rate being paid. And that's when we really see big moves in the silver and gold price. Right. You know, um, I, I think that your comments are really insightful. I, I think if they were... Um if they were able to, it would be in their best interest to actually keep raising rates if they want to keep um, inflation under control. And they're, they're in a situation where they'll start breaking stuff if they keep a, yeah. increasing rates right now. Um, yeah. And so, you know, they don't want the the train to come off the rails, so to speak. And um, I, I feel like uh, you're totally right that they're between a rock and a hard place that there's no good move for them to make right now. Um, and, I, you know, I bet you Oren's... Um, you know, idea in regards to that is absolutely correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, and I'll warn you, I'm often wrong, uh, but but that just seems to me that they're in a position, a precarious position. Let me ask you a question. I'll ask our viewer this question as well, because this totally applies to the situation we're in right now. You know what? As a matter of fact, I think to drive this position home or this idea home, I'm going to run out to the U.S. debt clock real quick because we like to check the U.S. debt clock during the live streams. It's just to make sure that the uh, the amount of debt is not going down. Bear with me here. One second. Oh, yeah. Okay. No sweat. Right. Yeah. And it's always fun to check it out and see what's okay. going on. 
Oh, hey, hey, if we if we stay on for a few more minutes, Brian, we'll get to 34 trillion 600 billion. Okay. <laughs> right? Is, it's coming here any cool. second, folks. It's coming here any second. Just hold on. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll do uh maybe we'll do the world's longest live stream. How long does it take for the United States to accrue another billion dollars of debt? Maybe that I, would I mean, be a short minute. It's right there, 34598. <laughs> there goes another 100 grand out the window. Okay. But let me, let me, let me, I'll ask the viewer this question. I'll ask you this question. Okay. Because this U.S. national debt is, as a percentage of GDP, by any measure, so much larger than what we had in the 1970s. I mean, they didn't even know what a trillion was in the 1970s. But let's, let's make it a real easy for you. Let's say, Brian, that you have, um, that you and your wife and your family, that you have a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Okay. okay. And you're paying 10% interest on it. So that's 10 grand a year, right? That stinks, yep. right? That stinks. Yeah. That's, but, but, you know, but you can make it, you can make it work, right? You decided that you'd, uh, you know, you went on a, on a fancy cruise and you, you know, paid, overpaid for a bathroom remodel, whatever you did, Brian, I don't care. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, you got a hundred grand in debt and you're paying 10%, right? That's one thing. Um, if you had a million dollars in debt, if it was 10 times higher, right, a million dollars in debt and you were paying 10 percent, then you've got 100 grand a year. And that 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 could be much more difficult. That would have much more of an impact on your ability um, to function and to live. Right. Absolutely. I mean, right. So so I think what the what I, what I'm what I'm saying is going on has gone on with this massive amount of debt that we have. Uh, 5% interest is huge, right? I think we're paying what, like a trillion dollars oh, yeah. a year in interest alone. People are like, oh, they, they need to raise rates like Volcker did to 15%. Well, we can't, it can, doesn't work. I mean, the 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 impact on the uh, fiscal situation of the United States at $34 trillion, $598 billion in debt at 5% is significant. Right. And, and that interest is is uh, is piling up. I mean, like what a uh, trillion dollars a year. Plus, our government is overspending by another, what, two trillion per year. This is this has become a uh, an untenable situation. They can't raise rates. I mean, the, the, you, you think uh, Jerome Powell is going to raise rates to eight percent if inflation spikes? It it the whole system doesn't work. You, that thirty four trillion can't absorb eight percent rates. The banks can't absorb eight percent rates with their with their underwater already on their bond on their bond portfolios. Does that right. make sense at all? Does that no? I, absolutely. And then you figure all of these um, these big commercial properties that they need to get refinanced before too long. I mean, if the rates are even higher than they are now, I mean it, the the. The ship is kind of sinking in, yeah. in regards to commercial real estate, and if they were to raise the rates again, I mean, they would just completely break that that sector. Yeah. And uh, you know, of course, even the residential stuff, it's unaffordable for most people nowadays. Um, not only do the prices need to come down a little bit, but the rates need to come down a little bit before the average person is able to buy a house they could comfortably live in again. Yeah, yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, my neighborhood, the, you know, the uh, a house that sold for three hundred thousand four years ago is selling for five hundred thousand now, and the rates are, you know, two three times the the mortgage rates are two or three times higher. The payments, yeah. the payments are three times higher. You know, because the the amount that needs to be financed because of this residential real estate bubble has expanded. And right, you went from needing to borrow three hundred thousand to live in my neighborhood to needing to borrow a half million to live in my neighborhood. And not only do you have to borrow a half million, but you have to borrow it at eight percent instead of three percent. So the payment, when you factor both those things in, has gone up by two, three times per month. I mean, people yeah, can't it's brutal. It. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. how how can people do this? It, well, they it, can't. It can't right. go on. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I heard Lynette Zhang say the other day, the whole banking sector, almost all the banks are insolvent. When you when you consider their commercial real estate portfolios, when you consider their bond holding portfolios, you know, the whole the whole system is uh, is is in kind of a precarious. But, you know, 
uh, here we are again. Another day has passed and nothing's happened, right? Until something has happened. I think Andy Sheckman says it's like Jenga, right? You take a piece out, you take a piece out. And then sometimes it's that one piece and the whole thing falls down. We don't want that to happen. Uh, but we also don't want to be, you know, like an ostrich. Is it an ostrich that sticks his head in the sand? Yes, I believe so. Okay. We don't yeah. want to. You know, we were just in Branson, Susie and I and the kids, and they have a drive through zoo. I'm going to put out a stark warning to everyone. If you're ever in a drive through zoo and you got your cup of animal feed, feed the ponies, feed the llamas. They're very nice. The ostriches will stick their heads into your car and try to get the whole bucket full of food. So just beware. <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah, they're pretty aggressive about it, it sounds like. They're very aggressive. They're very aggressive. You know, they're uh, they're like those. Uh, they remind me of those traders down at the Comex in the LBMA. Hey, Brian, <laughs> thank you for joining. We have had 300 people joining us today. Um, thank you for joining us. OK, it's been great as always. And, uh, you know, I hope that again sometime in the future, you'll be uh, back on here with me on a live stream. I'll encourage everybody go check out Brian's channel. I put a link to it in the description. Uh, he's a great guy, probably one of my favorite people I've met since I started the channel, uh, besides you, of course, the viewer. Uh, but Brian, in terms of another creator, is uh, just a great person and someone who I know genuinely believes in the future of silver and gold. Brian, do you have any parting words for the basement dwellers out there? Uh, yes, uh, I really appreciate you having me on today. Um, I appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, Ron's show is a great way to stay on top of what is going on in the gold and silver markets, you know, with his daily content. Um, I, I look forward to joining you again in the future. And yeah, th thanks again for having me. Yeah, thanks, Brian. We'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Have a good one.